My name is Brett Nelson. I'm the Director of Emergency Ultrasound at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. The purpose of this video chapter is to discuss ultrasound for procedure guidance. There are many procedures um, which would be greatly aided by the use of ultrasound. We're not going to speak about them in detail in this section, just giving you a brief overview of some common terminology, common procedural applications, tips, and tricks, and a little bit about how ultrasound works in general to better arm you to go forth and use ultrasound in the individual applications that the other chapters will describe in more detail. So ultrasound has been around, used in medical purposes for quite some time, although in the 1950s when it consisted of a room full of machinery and some poor person who had to sit into a large vat of uh, water, it wasn't exactly practical. By the 1990s, the U.S. government was very interested in having uh, combat medics use ultrasound at the point of care to diagnose injury, and partly through funding from a research grant from DARPA, we had the first ultrasound machines that were portable to the point of being able to be carried in the backpack into the theater. Uh, today, there are multiple machines from different vendors which actually can fit in the palm of your hand, and this miniaturization is one of the many reasons that ultrasound is so readily accessible in so many environments, and it so lends itself towards using it for guidance of procedures. So, very brief bit about physics, how the machine itself works. It really hinges around a piezoelectric crystal. A piezoelectric crystal is a very special kind of rock that can produce um, electrical energy when it changes shape, as you see here in the middle of the slide. And when you apply electrical energy to it, it changes shape. So once again, a piezoelectric crystal is a fancy rock that changes shape when you apply uh, current to it, and it will create a current when you change its shape. We can use this by embedding it within the head of the transducer and applying a brief electrical current to it. That causes it to vibrate and send out an ultrasound signal, and it basically traces a signal from one side to the other, sweeping through the body, creating an image that you're more used to seeing here, which we would call two-dimensional ultrasonography or 2D mode sometimes referred to as B mode, brightness mode. So basically the machine is sending out signal back and forth, fanning side to side to create the two-dimensional image that we'll be discussing through the rest of this chapter. So how do we use the controls on the machine? When you stare at your ultrasound machine, it can easily be as daunting as looking at this control panel um, for an aircraft, but let's start with something that you know instead. So here's a standard DVD player and you already know how to use this, even though you haven't read the manual, and you might not even know this particular brand. But looking at this, and looking at the common buttons and the symbols that are used on these buttons, you'll be able to tell me where the power button is, that the triangle is play, that the stop is a square, and that record is a red circle. And that's because every DVD player around the world, in every language from every company, has similar buttons. Not so with ultrasound. Every ultrasound manufacturer has a different machine shape and size, a different keyboard layout, so it can be very daunting for a new user getting ready to use this machinery. So here's what you need to know. Go to your machine and learn these buttons. Learn how to turn it on. That's the power button. See which button helps you select which probe you're going to use. And we'll talk about how to use the probe in just a minute. The next most important buttons on the machine are those that control gain, which is the brightness of the image, and depth, which is how large an image you're going to see on the screen. And then freeze and save are buttons that allow you to freeze the image on the screen, show them to your colleagues, or save them into an um, electronic medical record, or this might lead to a workflow where you print the image. But freeze and save on your device might have something to do with how you save the images for documentation purposes. So let's take these one by one. The power button, you're on your own. So starting with the probes, a couple of different probe types you should be familiar with. The phased array probe has a relatively narrow footprint. That's the gray square on the bottom right corner, and that's where the transducer actually interacts with the body. This device is optimized for looking at the heart because that narrow footprint helps it get in between the ribs and access the heart readily. But it's also pretty good for looking at the abdomen, and you can also look at the thorax with it. So consider this probe for those purposes. If you have a larger footprint probe, which is referred to as a curvilinear probe because of the curved shape of the ultrasound transducer, this is optimized for abdominal imaging, but it can also be used to image the thorax very well, and especially with a subxiphoid view, it can be used to look at the heart. 
The linear probe is a higher frequency probe than the previous two probes that we've just seen, and that means that it has a higher resolution and can show you a lot more detail. It doesn't penetrate as deeply into the body, but it can give a very crisp picture of superficial anatomy. That makes it very useful for looking at veins, looking at the skin and soft tissues, examining the thorax and the pleura, and is probably going to be your most commonly used transducer for most procedures that you do that involve guiding a needle into the body. And finally, another commonly used probe is the intracavitary probe. The, uh, call it intracavitary probe. You may refer to this as a transvaginal probe, but since it's not just used in the vagina, it can be uh, to, to look for the uterus, but it can also be uh, used transrectally by urologists to look at the prostate. It could be used by ENT physicians or emergency physicians to look at tonsils to detect peritonsil or abscess. And because it has a very tightly um, uh, curved um, curvilinear transducer, uh, on the end of it, which is high frequency, it can actually be used uh, and has been described in some studies as a surrogate for the linear probe in a pinch. So now that you're familiar with the different types of probes, how should you hold the probe? The simplest way to look at this is that you should hold the probe like you hold a pencil because you're already familiar with holding the pencil and you've already built some proprioception around that. Hold the probe with your first three fingers, as you can see on the bottom left side of the screen here, and use your remaining fingers and the heel of your hand to stabilize yourself on the patient. Remember that you're going to be gelling up the patient, so there's going to be a slippery interface between you and the patient, and it's inconvenient when you slip around and you try to maintain a view, when you're looking at the heart or the lungs, for example, but it's frankly dangerous to slip around when you're using the, needle, the probe to guide your other hand that's holding a needle. So stabilizing yourself is very important. So imagine that you're holding the probe and actually writing on the patient as you do so. So windows are a very popular topic that are discussed very frequently among sonographers. We always talk about getting a better window and improving your view and you can't get a good window over the ribs. So what exactly do we mean by that? Well, let's take a break for a second and think about light because we're all much more familiar with how light works. So I'll give you a definition of a window from a light perspective. A window is a part of a building that allows light to pass through unimpeded so you can see stuff. That makes sense to you because you've probably looked out a window at some point. So think about a sonographic window as the exact same thing but for sound waves. So the definition of a sonographic window is a part of the body that allows sound waves to pass through unimpeded so you can see stuff inside the body. So what type of structure allows sound to transmit unimpeded through the body. Well, sound loves to transmit through liquid. Think of the gel being liquid and most of your body being liquid. So things that are organ dense inside the body are good windows, like the spleen, the liver. Things that are liquid dense are excellent windows, like the bladder, for example. This is why radiology departments frequently love to have patients for pelvic ultrasound have a very full bladder. This is so that they can get a good window. So, just like this fish, your ultrasound transducer does not like air and it wants to stick with water or water dense structures. So, let's get back to the probe for a minute. There's going to be a marker on your probe. It'll be a divot or a line or a ridge. Sometimes it's an LED light, but something that highlights one side of the probe from the other, as marked here by this green dot. So, that probe marker just denotes a particular orientation of the probe. And this is important for how we're going to actually image the body. Just remember that on the ultrasound screen, there's going to be a probe marker as well. In this image, I have it highlighted as a little green dot to match the little green dot on the ultrasound transducer. So what you need to remember is that the ultrasound transducer has a probe marker, and that probe marker equals the dot on the screen. So if you're holding the probe, so that the probe marker is facing towards the patient's right, then on your ultrasound screen, the little dot is going to be on the patient's right-hand side. If you have the probe marker towards the head, then the little dot is towards the patient's head, and that will help orient you with respect to where the anatomy is as you scan through the patient. So take this example where we're looking through a transverse view in the sub region. Holding the probe marker towards the patient's right means the dot's on the patient's right. So that means everything on the dot side of the screen is the patient's right. Everything on the opposite side is towards the patient's left. Everything near the probe is anterior. Everything far from the probe is posterior. So now let's look on the machine controls. 
So gain is the control you're probably going to use most frequently. Gain controls the volume, and you're going to use the volume knob on your ultrasound machine as often as you use the volume knob on your television set when you're watching TV. So the middle image here of the liver is gained appropriately. There's black in that image, there's white in that image, and there's a whole dynamic range of gray. So just like any good quality black and white photograph, this image is perfectly gained. The image on the left is too dark. The image on the right is too bright. So you're going to manipulate your gain knob, which on this machine is a set of knobs on the left-hand side, but it may be uh, sliders or even a graphic equalizer appearing thing like you see on the right lower side of the screen here to use this, these controls to make sure that the machine is appropriately gained so it looks something like the image in the middle. So depth is another very important control that we spoke about earlier. Depth controls how long the machine listens inside the body. If it just listens very quickly, it'll only hear superficial structures. If it listens for returning echoes much longer, it will get deeper structures. And we want to create an image on the screen that's going to show us everything we want to see and nothing we don't. So in this image, for example, of the right upper quadrant, we want to look at a nice big view of Morrison's pouch in between the liver and the kidney. So this is too close up, that's too far away, and that is just right. Too far away, too close, and just right. So use the depth buttons to control the depth of the image so that you're looking at the screen in the appropriate size. On most machines, if you look in the right lower area of the ultrasound screen, it'll tell you what your total depth is in centimeters to give you some rough sense of how deep you are. It's probably best for most indications to start off too deep and work your way more shallow, making images look too small at first and then zooming in on them. So on this machine, the depth controls are top and bottom. On other machines, it can be a control knob or a dial. So let's speak a little bit about the language of ultrasound. We've spoken about bright and dark, and we used terms of echogenicity to describe that in ultrasound. So here's an example of a procedure. We have near the top of the screen skin and soft tissue. Just below that, a bright white line, which is the anterior wall of the internal jugular vein. So we have this long strip that is the internal jugular vein running across as a dark border across the top, near the top of the screen. And within it, going down diagonally where the arrowhead is pointing, we see a guide wire. This guide wire is bright white. We call that echogenic or hyperechoic. And in fact, since it's metal, it has some reverberation artifacts denoted by the asterisk coming down behind it. So this is a longitudinal view. Let's go over this again in a transverse view where we see skin and soft tissue being um, medium echogenicity. We then see this large elliptical structure which is anechoic inside, which is the uh, internal jugular vein. And this bright white structure is the guide wire. And since it's metallic, it has reverberation artifacts coming down from below it. So the arrowhead itself is the guide wire, which is hyperechoic and the structure are surrounding it, all that fluid, which is anechoic, because it has no returning echoes. The ultrasound energy does not interact with it. So now the part of the lecture that you came here for, procedure guidance. So let's start by going over a couple of terms. Landmark approach generally refers to the type of approach where you use surface anatomy and other landmarks to uh, craft a path towards your procedure. A lot of folks, especially ultrasound uh, enthusiasts, tend to refer to this as a blind technique, which I think is a bit unfair. The landmark approaches for procedures have been around for centuries, and it's not like the first couple of editions of Roberts and Hedges were called the Roberts and Hedges Guide to Blindly Procedurizing Your Patients. But how do we do a landmark approach? Well, you look at the patient's anatomy, and for example, here, if you were going to look at an internal jugular anatomy, you look at the heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and decide for yourself that that's the spot that you want to go. Then you would prep and drag the patient and go through your procedure using your landmarks as a guide. So ultrasound can help with this, and there's two ways you can use ultrasound. One is what's referred to as a static technique, and with a static technique, you look at the patient, you decide where you think you should go, and then you apply the ultrasound transducer to that area to visualize the anatomy. So here we see the neck, decide using landmarks where you'd like to go, and then use ultrasound. And here you can see something like this, where the sternocleidomastoid muscle is near the top of the screen. 
you see the internal jugular vein, which is the large anechoic area in the center, near the center of the screen. And off to its right, you see the carotid artery. So now you know exactly where you'd like to go. And the anatomy has revealed itself very elegantly. So now you can put an X exactly over the spot on the internal jugular vein that you would like to go, prep and drape the patient, and move on with your procedure without using the ultrasound any further than you already have to mark the spot. This technique has been used with uh, venous cannulation. It's also been used commonly for procedures like thoracentesis, paracentesis, or other things where you're aiming for a large target. So finally, there's ultrasound guidance in a dynamic fashion. And dynamic means that you're actually using the ultrasound transducer the entire time to guide in real time your needle towards its target. So again, you start off with the ultrasound uh, looking at the vessels. You set up the patient, and we'll go into some more detail on this in a moment. And then you perform the procedure guiding the needle as you go. So you can watch the needle the entire time from the skin down into the vein when you get the flash. So let's have a look at this image for a second and deconstruct the parts. First, let's talk about the machine setup itself. You want to have your ultrasound machine set up in an area that you can see it easily. So set up your procedure like you normally would do the procedure. So set up, for example, your internal jugular venous cannulation exactly like you normally would. Tray table, gown, gloves, drape, prep, and uh, make sure that you're set up comfortably for this procedure. Then put the machine in a location where you can easily look down at your hands and at the patient and up at the ultrasound screen because that's guiding you the entire time. Think about it as if you, when you first sit into the car that you adjust your rear view mirror. So you can look at the road and the rear view mirror back and forth seamlessly as you drive. Same thing when you're using ultrasound. The next thing we're going to talk about is what you do with your probe hand, which for the purposes of this talk I'll speak about your non-dominant hand being your left hand and what you do with your syringe hand, which again for the purposes of this talk will be your right hand or your dominant hand. So what is your probe hand doing? So your probe hand is holding the probe comfortably with the first three fingers like you're holding a pencil and the heel of your hand or your pinky or ring finger are stabilized on a surface or on the patient. This is really critical for procedure guidance especially because we can't have this slipping around while you're looking at the screen. Notice that the probe marker is being held towards your left. And that is going to come up a little bit more later, but the idea is we want the left side of the probe to be on your left so that the image generated by that ultrasound machine can be like a heads up display for you. So your left is the probe's left is the screen's left. And that will avoid any confusion for you thinking which side is left and which side is right. So you can make this sterile. And you might want to do this for a lot of different procedures like vascular access, nerve blocks, foreign body localization, or other things. So in the left side of the screen here, we have a sterile operator who's um, gloved and gowned and draped and wearing the hat and everything. And we have in the near field or in the foreground here, a dirty hand holding a dirty probe with dirty gel on it. So that's not sterile. So using the sterile probe cover, the operator can put the probe into it. Or a technique that I prefer is you stick your hand into the ultrasound transducer cover like a sock puppet and then um, uh, take the ultrasound probe inside of it. Place a couple rubber bands, push out any air, and apply some sterile gel to the end of it. And again, this is going to be a commonly used technique anytime you're doing an ultrasound procedure that involves sterility. So what should your, your dominant hand be doing, your, your needle hand? So very frequently people hold a syringe like they're holding a pencil. I already told you that's how you'd want to hold a probe. And there is some stability that you get from holding a, uh, a syringe this way. But one thing you don't get from holding a syringe this way is you can't pull any negative pressure onto the plunger. So you need two hands to use the plunger if you're going to hold it this way, or you have to move your hand. And both of these are potentially unstable. Instead, I'd recommend holding the plunger part of the syringe so you can pull a little bit of negative pressure as soon as your needle is underneath the skin. In real time this looks like this. You can pull negative pressure and if you needed to inject you can inject. And this technique is helpful for central venous access but also anytime you're underneath the skin with a needle you want to know if you hit a vessel even when you're not trying to hit a vessel. So this is a helpful technique for when you're infiltrating lidocaine, when you're doing a nerve block uh, or other procedures where you have a needle under the patient's body. Because if you can stabilize your needle 
and your syringe with one hand and you're able to pull negative pressure with that one hand, your other hand, your non-dominant hand is free to hold the transducer or to stabilize the hub of the needle or to do other things while your right hand controls the progression of the syringe and the needle. So what are the benefits of being able to hold negative pressure? First, you're going to have um, a sensation of pressure change when you enter the vessel. So you're going to feel and get that formal feedback. You're going to see a flash in the syringe, and it's easier to do that when you have a little bit of negative pressure in the syringe. And finally, you'll see the needle entering the vessel on ultrasound. Now, in real life, you might not get all three of these feedback mechanisms to let you know that you've entered the vessel um, or that you've hit your target on ultrasound. But if you are set up that you can have all three of these, you'll get at least one or two of them almost every time. And having more ways of knowing that you're in the spot is helpful. So where do we position the patient? So if you're going to do a procedure, put the patient in the exact same position you would normally put them for the procedure. So in the setting of this paracentesis, for example, we have the patient sitting up and we're looking in the right lower quadrant uh, to see if there was a good pocket of ascites to look at. In general, you want to examine the patient from the right side if you're going to do a diagnostic ultrasound. And if it's a procedure ultrasound to guide a needle placement or to guide a procedure, you would put the patient in whatever position you would normally set them up for that procedure. And again, just to reiterate, we want to have the ultrasound machine in very easy view. So you don't have to move your head around to look at the machine. And you can look back and forth between the machine and the patient very easily. If the probe is in your left hand with the probe marker towards your left, no matter what the orientation of the patient is, then that means that the left side of the screen is the left side of the probe is the left side of you. So if you visualize your needle too far to the left, you can pull back, redirect it towards the right hand side. And you don't have to think about, is the left of the screen my left, or is it the patient's left? And, you know, and uh, that's not a, the type of thoughts you want to have when you have a needle in someone's body. So there are a couple of main approaches that are described for venous access, foreign body localization, nerve blocks, and other procedures. There's an in-plane approach that we see on the left side here, where you have the ultrasound probe parallel to the vessel or parallel to the structure that you're of interest and the needle goes in plane with that ultrasound beam and you get an image that looks like the black and white image just next to it on the screen. An out of plane approach refers to inserting your needle in a transverse plane perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. That creates an image to the right of that side on the black and white image. There are some pros and cons to both of these, and there are huge advocates for both of these techniques. So I suggest that you get familiar with both of them and make up your own mind. The pros of the in-plane approach is you can see the entire needle, including the tip of the needle. And you can see the trajectory and the depth at every given moment. The downside is it's technically challenging to maintain the probe hand on your left side with no movement at all and keeping your needle entirely in plane. And you don't see as much anatomy, meaning that if you veer off plane, it's hard to tell if you veered to one side or the other side out of plane. And other structures that you may not want to hit, like nerves or arteries, they're not visualized in that plane. And therefore, you can't tell where the tip of the needle is if it goes off plane. In the out of plane approach, you do get to see that lateral anatomy. We see on the right hand side here, for example, we can see the ellipse with the thin wall of the internal jugular vein. The thicker wall, deeper vessel would be the carotid. So we can see if we're doing an internal jugular venous cannulation, for example, all the anatomy we would need to see. And we can adjust from left to right if we're going too far to one side or the other. The downside of this technique is you have to make sure that the, the ultrasound plane intersects only with the tip of the needle and not the shaft. And this is technically challenging because both your hands have to move. As you insert the needle, you need to move the probe to keep the plane in the appropriate spot. So each of these has pluses and minuses, and it's definitely worth being comfortable with both approaches. So here's an example of the difficulties with the short axis approach. Right now, this needle is placed in at about a 45 degree angle, and it's right at the brink of entering the vessel. And we see on the screen that we can see the tip of the needle and with some reverberation artifact coming down like a little comet from it. The ultrasound probe is held so that the plane is cutting just through the tip of the needle. But if we move the probe to demonstrate what it would look like if you were going through the shaft of the needle instead of the tip, we can see that you can get the false impression of where the tip of the needle is. So the needle tip here hasn't moved at all, but the probe is not always at the tip. So you don't always get a sense of where the true tip of the needle is. 
So this can be dangerous and give you a false sense. So the idea is that you want to walk slowly the needle into the plane. And each time the needle encounters the plane of the ultrasound beam, you move the ultrasound beam further away from you until it's no longer visible. And then you insert the tip a little bit further, and now it's visible again. Move the plane, and now you don't see it. Insert the needle, and now you do see it. And this now you see it, now you don't approach can actually become a little more fluid, although it starts off choppy. When it's fluid, it can look something like this, where you follow the tip of the needle all the way down to the vessel or to the nerve or to the foreign body, whichever procedure that you're using a short axis technique with, and you walk the needle along the ultrasound beam, moving both hands as you do so. In contrast, with a long axis approach, you keep the beam fixed in its position. So you use your non-dominant hand to define the optimal landing strip for your needle, and then you don't move the landing strip. And your goal with your right hand is to keep the needle moving only in that plane. And when you do this, it's very elegant. You can see the image that you see on the right hand side of the screen there is it's showing you exactly where the tip of the needle is. And you just have to make sure that you don't move, in this case, your left hand. So hopefully that helped to give you a good sense of uh, starting off with getting familiar with the controls of the machine, how to set yourself up for the procedure, and a couple of different techniques to use when appro approaching different procedures. And these are going to be common for most of the procedures that you use. So you should definitely consider any time that you are going to put a needle inside of a patient, think about how you could use ultrasound to guide that needle to decrease complications, to increase your effectiveness, and improve your care. If you have any questions um, about what uh, we discussed in this video, or if you want to contact me, please reach me through my Division's Ultrasound website at sinaiem.us. Good luck.